Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot, or welcome if this is your first time here. My name is Sarah and today we are going to look, finally, at A.E. Waite and Aleister Crowley and their similarities and differences. So this is a video I've been wanting to make for a while. I've been doing lots of research and um, I've discovered lots of interesting things. So I'm going to share those with you today. I do invite your uh, gentle commentary and criticism down in the comments. Um, I may say some things that are controversial uh, according to today's tarot practitioners or that might even be um, slightly inflammatory. If you are a devout uh, student of one of these um, tarot authorities, I guess you could call them, uh, so just bear in mind that, you know, all of these opinions are my own and you're welcome to have your own opinions. But these are just some things that I wanted to share based on my own reading and my own perception of these two uh, tarot influencers. So let's get started. We're going to start with our source material here. And so I do want to give credit uh, where wherever I can. Um, so the first book that I read is this one, A.E. Wait, Magician of Many Parts, uh, published by R.A. Gilbert. This is a biography of Arthur Edward Wait. It was published by a small press in England called Crucible in 1987. And so it is out of print. It is hard to get copies of this. I was lucky to find a used copy on an online bookseller, um, but I've seen them uh, I've seen copies of this book go for a lot of money and um, it's really, it's quite thin and it's good. It's very well researched. Um, you can see all my bookmarks in here uh, with lots of footnotes and endnotes and citations and things like that. It's proper scholarly uh, biography. So um, it's good. It is, it is very scholarly and it's rather dense. It took me a while to get through this book. Um, and then the other things that I'm going to draw on are... Uh, Lawrence Sutton's biography of Crowley, Do What Thou Wilt, A Life of Aleister Crowley, and this one was first published, well, it's copyright 2000, I don't, I don't know if that's the first date, but um, I assume so. So a little bit more recent. Uh, this one is still in print and still very much readily available. And then I also have uh, read bits and pieces of this book, Understanding Alistair Crowley's Thoth Tarot by Lon Milo Duquette. This is the new edition. Uh, those are my sources, and I will uh, include a complete bibliography down below on this video so you can check those out. Um, the, the Lawrence Sutton biography is also, I should say, heavily notated and uh, very well researched. And it's very thick, and so I did not read that that entire book. Um, I have read just bits and pieces of the Crowley book because, frankly, I didn't want to read 500 pages on Aleister Crowley. Um, that's what it boiled down to. So I read the first little bits, um, which talk about his beliefs and his kind of goals on a spiritual level, and that gave me enough to do this video. So let's dive into uh, the, the similarities and the differences between these two gentlemen. Uh, their goals and sort of their influences on tarot today. So we'll start with a brief biography. Um, and I am <laughs> using this. I don't know if this is the most interesting uh, visual for you, but you can see my notes here. So um, they, uh, Arthur Edward Waite, A.E. Waite, was born in 1857. And Edward Alexander Crowley, as he was christened, uh, was born in 1875. So they're about 18 years apart in age, almost a generation, uh, Crowley being the younger person. Um, they both lived in London a great deal of their lives. Uh, Crowley was born in Lemington, which is out in the country, and um, they were raised Christian. Um, so A.E. Waite's mother converted to Catholicism when he was very young, um, which was still rather unusual back then. If you remember from your English history, of course, we had Henry VIII dissolving the Catholic Church in England and installing himself as the leader of the church. <clears throat> Sounds familiar. Um, and uh, Catholicism was banned. It was made illegal um, for a long time. 
People were persecuted and killed uh, and hunted down for being practice the, practicing the Catholic faith. And it wasn't until a few years before Waite's mother um, converted to Catholicism that it was officially legal again in England to practice Catholicism openly. So this would have been um, almost unheard of to convert from Protestant Christianity to Catholicism in a very non, you know, rather anti-Catholic country. Um, Crowley, on the other hand, was raised in a very um, strict sectarian uh, form of Christianity called the Plymouth Brethren. And I did not do any independent research on them um, based on the biography of him. Um, again, this was like a very strict uh, puritanical kind of puritanical evangelical type of upbringing. Um, so, and he, he very much balked at that. Um, whereas Waite basically embraced his, his Catholic, uh, upbringing. In terms of their social status, of their families, uh, and themselves, um, Arthur Waite's family died when, or, sorry, Arthur Waite's, uh, father died when he was either very young or just before he was born. Um, and it's unclear as to when and where his parents got married. So there's there was some always some kind of lingering suspicion that he was born to parents that were not married. And this would have been a big deal in Victorian England. Um, very much not acceptable, very much, you know, um, would put you in the in the space of being a social pariah. Um, so he had a disadvantage there. Also, his you know, his father was a sailor. Um, he didn't leave his widow very much money. And so his mother had to rely on the generosity of relatives um, uh, for support and basically had to move back in with her parents after her husband died, um, at least initially. Eventually she took on um, work outside of the home in order to raise her children. Um, A.U.A. also had a sister. Um, and then Crowley was born to upper middle class family. Uh, his father had inherited a fortune from Crowley's grandfather and did not need to work. And so he was, you know, a gentleman, um, AKA a trust fund baby. Um, and Crowley received a high class education, first rate, you know, private schools, all that. Um, Waite uh, was an aspiring academic, but um, sort of got high school in dribs and drabs, I think maybe took a couple of classes at one of the elite colleges, but never, uh, never went to university, never got a chance to go to university, he couldn't afford to go. Crowley was educated at Trinity College, Cambridge, and he focused on mountaineering and poetry as well. And then early influences in their education. So wait, uh, like I said, spent a lot of time in the library at the British Museum, which he could use for free. Uh, reading all sorts of occult, occult texts, and in particular the works of Eliphas Lévy, um, who was a French occultist, and who um, whose lifetime overlapped with Waits because Lévy died uh, just a few months before Crowley was born. Heavily influential in occult studies, um, but his works had not been fully translated into English. So Waite was reading him in the French and then was actually one of the early translators of Levy's work. Um, Crowley was uh, also influenced by Eliphas Levy heavily, as well as um, other Kabbalistic teachings and writings. And maybe um, unconsciously, uh, according to the biography, um, probably unconsciously, but also brought in those teachings from the Plymouth Brethren um, into his philosophy that he developed. So even though he didn't um, respect Christianity or want to incorporate it, it, it still seems to have gotten into his philosophy um, and permeated it in a big way. In terms of uh, their careers, um, both were poets, and um, Waite was a translator. Um, like I said, he had translated a lot of works of by Levy and also other occult writers. 
Um, he was an author. Um, he worked for an advertising and marketing company, wrote lots of uh, ad copy. Um, he was a lecturer and, of course, a, for lack of a better term, religious leader. Um, Crowley also was a poet, um, wrote lots of homoerotic poetry, which, uh, to his credit, Lawrence Sutton um, does mention in here, in his biography, that um, Crowley ought to be more recognized for his gay poetry um, than he is, and perhaps at some future time, maybe. Um, he was also an author, and I um, put demigod because that's certainly what he aspired to. Um, they were both members of the Golden Dawn, Crowley quite briefly, only for a couple of years. Uh, Waite had a longer stint and kind of off-again, on-again relationship with the Golden Dawn. Um, so I'm going to talk more about the history of the Golden Dawn specifically when I talk about the Golden Dawn tarot deck and then compare Waite and Crowley's decks with that one. So the Golden Dawn came out of this fascination with the occult that started in France uh, and was very popular in the 1880s and um, essentially uh, English um, occultists wanted to have their own society and so they created the Golden Dawn. It was led by Samuel Westcott and McGregor Mathers initially um, and um, it was a big influence on Waite and Crowley even though they both eventually um, had their own issues with the organization. The organization kind of had an internal schism and there were all these factions and people that were trying to um, do what they thought was the correct rights and the correct practices of the Golden Dawn. And, you know, so that went out into a bunch of different directions around 1900 when this kind of internal civil war thing happened. The entirety of the Golden Dawn teachings, exercises, philosophy, everything else is made up. Now, I don't say that with scorn, right? All religions are essentially made up. Um, all spiritual practices are derived in some way, right, um, by, by people. Um, and they may say, oh, well, I, I, you know, I received a word from God, or I had a vision, or I went on a quest, or I received uh, teachings from some, you know, mystical practice that I've done, or whatever. But it all comes down to human beings saying these things, and then writing them down and saying, you know, this is the way to practice this stuff. This is what we're trying to accomplish. You know, here are the methods and the rites and the rituals and the tools um, that are going to get us to this spiritual goal, right? So that's true for every religion or every uh, philosophical pursuit or whatever you want to call these things as a group. Um, so I don't, I don't say that with a lot of disdain uh, per se. What I will say is that the Golden Dawn was also founded on a hoax. Um, and there were the, the so-called uh, teachings, etc., uh, that were received um, were not received. They were written down and, and fabricated by um, Samuel Westcott, as far as we know. So while I don't fault um, any particular belief system for being based on human ideas. <laughs> um, I don't like this kind of misappropriation, reappropriation, cultural appropriation that gets woven into a lot of um, occult teachings in particular. I don't know why, but there seems to be this, this need, this drive for the leaders uh, in these instances, both Crowley and Waite do this too, um, to say, oh, it's not me that's giving you this information or that discovered this practice or that's, you know, forming this group. It was given to me by, you know, the ancient Egyptians or Sufis in Tibet or, you know, of um, some other fake historical uh, source. And that's what bothers me. Um, you can't just say, hey, I think this is what we should do. Um, I've got a great new way to practice um, spiritual advancement or Kabbalah or whatever it is. Uh, let's all do this. It, it's, it, it has to have more um, oomph, I guess, <laughs> more 
secret uh, mojo. <laughs> has to have more secret mojo in order to be taken seriously, and that makes me take it less seriously. Um, but again, that's one of my opinions, so I'll leave that there for the minute. All right, so let's look at their spiritual goals and methods. So on the surface, these kind of smell similar to me, but I am, I am sure that to each of these men that they thought that the other person was not, didn't have the right goal or um, wasn't engaged in the correct pursuit. So Waite was definitely more Christian. He was Christian. Um, and what he was trying to do was to use Gnosis, um, to use spiritual development, to become one with God through meditation and these different rites and rituals. He was a, he was a um, ceremonial magician. And this combination of spiritual and religious devotion in, in, in combination with personal reflection was supposed to be how you, you essentially glimpse this connection with God. And really you can only fully experience that when you die, but you can get glimpses of it. You can get hints of it um, as a devout practitioner in your lifetime. That's what I understand that we was trying to do. Uh, if you have a different understanding, again, leave a comment. Uh, be nice. Uh, Crowley, on the other hand, um, and this is a really interesting idea. Um, it, it's not that I agree with him, but it's fascinating to me. So he's he's more radical. He's actually looking at an alchemical process to transform yourself, um, not just your spirit, but your your whole entire self, to become a godhead. So not to merge with God, um, which is always going to be an entity that is is kind of aloof from you but to actually take on the attainment of, of a Godhead, to, to uh, come into your personal power to such a degree that you attain a godlike status. Um, and, it's, and it's very interesting. And I can understand why, to some degree, why this ended up being his goal, because you know, he was bullied as a child. He was bisexual, which was just like beyond taboo in his in his lifetime. Um, and so I'm sure he felt very much like an outcast, even though he came from privilege. He had this very strict religious upbringing that he didn't agree with, that didn't jive with his personality. And so this is his way of rebelling and saying, no, I don't need your outside influence. I can do it myself. This is like DIY deity. <laughs> um, I, I can do this on my own. And so can everyone else. So can each other person who practices these methods and subscribes to my beliefs. So it's empowering. It's interesting. Um, it's also incredibly ego-driven. And from my perspective, that's problematic because you get caught up in your own your own stuff, you know, and you can't look at it objectively because what you're trying to do is basically bring that out more and express it more fully. Um, so that's, that's tricky. Um, but it is interesting. All right. So after the golden dawn, Waite goes on to found the, what he called the independent and rectified order, um, in 1903. And it was around that time that he kind of stopped participating in Golden Dawn activities. Um, and then later on, the rectified order kind of falls apart. And so he found something called the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross, which is closer to Rosicrucian uh, practices. And that was in 1915. Um, he also just liked being the head of stuff and like making up clubs and being in charge of them. So he had uh, a number of different... Um, kind of social clubs um, that had, you know, secret passwords and orders and rules. 
and he was always in charge and, um, you know, whatever that, that you had to do. So he had one that was like ostensibly a writing club. Um, but, uh, Gilbert in his biography says basically it's a drinking club, um, called the pen and pencil club. And I would, <laughs> as a sidebar, uh, I think it would be funny to found like a pen and pencil club, um, today. Anyway, um, the fellowship of the Rosy cross dies with weight. Um, Crowley founded something that he called Thelema, uh, which he called Rational Kabbalistic Philosophy of Spiritual Self-Sufficiency. And this is through the organization Ordo Templi Orientis, which is still alive today thanks to the explosion of New Age occult investigations of the 1970s. Essentially, it almost went dead. There were a few, there was one temple of just a few people practicing in California. And wouldn't you know it, 1970 comes around and all of a sudden this new age movement really starts to get some gas behind it. And, you know, next thing you know, his deck gets published and the whole thing takes off. And this new resurgence in Crowley's writings uh, really explodes. Um, their decks. So um, Arthur Edward Waite. Uh, worked with Pamela Coleman Smith to develop Art Nouveau style illustrations. She that was mostly her style, um, but based on medieval imagery. And I'll show you a few. I'm sure you are quite familiar with this deck, but we'll just look at them. Um, Pamela Coleman Smith, when she developed this artwork, only submitted the line work. So, and then either William Ryder or Writer and 8U8 together, we're not really sure, um, chose the colors. So that's how that was developed. And it was developed in a very short time period. Um, I think it was about six months. It might have been a little bit longer than that. But it was definitely less than a year. And Pamela Coleman Smith had to come up with, of course, 78 pieces of art. Um, I do know that Waite was very involved in choosing a lot of the symbolism and the compositions for these uh, majors, the trumps, and then he was a little bit less involved with the minors, um, or at least some of the minor cards. So this is his deck, which you're all familiar with, um, and he changed the Golden Dawn. He rearranged the eight and the 11 positions. So he swapped strength and justice. And so then you have Alistair Crowley's deck. And this is in the, oops, I have a, I have a stray word here, excuse me. Deco. So this is in a more Art Deco style. Lady Frida Harris was the person who he worked with. And they worked on, on this uh, mostly by correspondence, by letter, um, for a number of years, at least five, and I've heard up to seven or eight um, that these images were worked on. So you can see in the amount of detail and shading that Lady Frida Harris had this long, much longer span of time to refine the artwork, to give Crowley uh, drafts, of her paintings, have him critique them, go back to the drawing board in some cases, redo them, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a lot more detail in here, and of course these are based on oil paintings, so there's, you know, she's working in full color here, um, and then the details reproduced on the cards. So big difference in the amount of detail and the art style uh, between the two decks. You'll also see that Crowley renamed a number of the cards, for example, Temperance is now Art, um, and he did keep, I believe, strength and justice in their places, but he renamed strength lust, and um, I haven't really studied this in full detail, so... Oh, right, the, e, the Aeon is um, judgment, and then the universe is the world. So he named, he renamed a few, and um, but kept the order, I think, the same as the Golden Zon, right? No, justice, yeah, justice is adjustment and strength is lust. So they're in the same place, but they're called something different. So that's, that's Aleister Crowley's deck.
the publication history on these two decks. So the Roses and Lilies edition of the RWS is published in 1909 for the first time. It was a small private run. It was just meant for um, A.E. Waits friends and close acquaintances um, and maybe a few Golden Dawn members. And in 1960, it comes over to the U.S. for the first time and is published by University Books. And I don't have a lot of detail on how that happened. If anybody out there does know, I would love to know more about how the University Books press got hold of the plates, how they chose the colors, who chose the colors, because they end up publishing this really vibrant, kind of electrically colored um, deck that has a lot more uh, blues and purples and pinks in it than this original version does. Um, and I think that is one of the reasons that it became so popular in the 1960s with the fad for um, bright clothing and all of that coming into the forefront. So I would love to know more about that. But anyway, um, that kicks off a trend. Then you have Frank Albano coming in to publish his own recolored, corrected version of the deck. And then uh, Samuel Weiser picks it up around the same time that um, Stuart Kaplan also picks it up. And there's a little bit of overlap in 1971. And again, the publication and copyright history is kind of a jumble there. Um, definitely some, some oddities going on. Um, but interestingly, Ryder also retains copyright of that deck and still publishes a version in the UK. Also, A.G. Mueller, who used to publish cards for US Games, also publishes a version. So yeah, it's very interesting how that all plays out. Um, in contrast, Crowley's deck um, took so long um, to develop, and then he was quite ill by the end of his life. He was a drug addict, um, among many other things. And um, so his health was not good um, towards the end of his life. Uh, the first printing of the Thoth book was in 1944. It was just a run of 200 copies, and it wasn't reprinted again until 1972, um, again by Samuel Weiser, and then picked up also around the same time by U.S. Games. So, um, you know, and that from there, both decks really entered the popular consciousness, even outside of occult studies and whatever. It just, it, you know, these images are used in advertising and um, concert posters and all kinds of things. So that's kind of how things uh, expand until the present day. Um, so we've talked about the history of these two uh, people. I just want to also draw a few more comparisons um, before I sign off today. So both are heavily uh, influenced by Christianity and, Christianity and Kabbalah. Um, even though Crowley really renounces um, the what he thought was basically the spiritual stranglehold of Christianity um, on the general public. He felt like um, Christianity and particularly Catholicism was inhibiting people's ability to think for themselves and to find their own spiritual path. And so that's how he comes up with this mantra, do what thou wilt. It's really about pursuing the path as you see fit, pursuing your spiritual development by whatever means you need to, including breaking social taboos and, um, you know, going against things that you've been taught about right and wrong um, and things like that. So he gets a, he gets a reputation for being, um, I, I don't know, all kinds of things that he wasn't a Satanist and this and that. Um, but that wasn't really his aim. But I also think he wasn't afraid to be labeled in a in a sort of scandalous light um, because he knew he was going to be running up against established institutions, established belief systems. So he's kind of doing this, you know, and just saying, fine, you know, call me a Satanist, call me a this, I don't care. I'm just doing my own thing and encouraging other people to find their own way as well. The other thing I want to mention is that, you know, these men were products of their time. Uh, in that they were sexist and racist and anti-Semitic. And 
I think it's important to know that because when you're reading their writings, I can see, I can see that in their writing. And while I don't think those views are included in order to be hateful, um, I do think it's, you know, something they've absorbed through the culture of their time. Um, I'm not going to write it off and excuse it uh, just because it was de rigueur to have these um, beliefs or these viewpoints. So it's definitely something to keep in mind when you're reading works by both of them. Um, and I guess I'll just, I'll leave that there. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I want to mention is that they both created rectified or corrected versions of the tarot. And they weren't interested in tarot as a standalone practice. I'll say that again. Neither one of them was interested in tarot as a standalone practice of any kind. Divination, fortune telling, personal development. It was not meant to be tarot reading. Um, it was not meant to be self-help. It was not meant to be self-care the way that, they, that we want to use it now. Both Waite and Crowley created these decks essentially as decks of flashcards. They contain symbols to remind the learner, the, um, the person who is either trying to come up through the Golden Dawn system or the Rosy Cross uh, system that A.E. Waite invented, or the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis that, that, and Thelema that Crowley created. The cards are meant to teach you the principles of those practices. And I think that's very important to know because these two decks are not about tarot in general. Um, they're about these two philosophies that these two people developed. And they're not really meant to be used outside of those two. Now, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use them outside of those goals or systems or whatever. But again, if you're going to read A.E. Waite's Pictorial Key to the Tarot, or you're going to read Crowley's Book of Thought, you should know what their end game is. I think that's important. And if your end game is not to follow the philosophy of Thelema or the philosophy of the Rosy Cross, then you at least need to know that this is the framework for what they thought you should be doing. And you're going to have to reconcile whatever your own goals are in studying their works with their intention and their viewpoint. And I think, too, both of them would be upset, if not horrified, <laughs> at the way that we use tarot in a more casual or open way today. Um, and again, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think tarot existed before Wade and Crowley, and I'm glad that it exists after them as well. Um, and it's sort of, it's just circumstantial that their decks became popular because of, you know, because of a public consciousness and a, a pop culture phenomenon that has become New Age thinking. Um, and that happened at the same time that these publishers got hold of this artwork. It could have been other decks that became popularized, but for whatever combinations of reasons, it's these that have become very popular. Um, and I think you can use, I think you can use both decks in other ways, um, than the, than the, these authors intended or originated. I think you can use the Thoth deck in other ways. I think you can use the Wade deck in other ways. But I do, th I, going back to my earlier point, I think you have to be conscious of what their intentions were, particularly if you're not just picking up the pack of cards and using them. If you're going to read their writings, you have to understand what they were trying to do. Because otherwise, A, the writings aren't going to make any sense. And B, you're going to memorize a whole bunch of information that may or may not be relevant to you as, 
as a person either interested in their development or as a tarot reader. Um, and I think there's, there's a conflict that I see in people who talk about like, oh, I'm going to study A.E. Waits writing. I'm going to study the Thoth, Thoth system. And that's that, you know, studying these, uh, these things will make you a better tarot reader, make you a smarter person, make you more adept, more familiar. You know, you're going to go deep into this knowledge and it's going to somehow improve your relationship with tarot or improve your ability to read cards. And, and I do think that's not true. Um, I think you can learn to read other decks intuitively. I think you can learn to read Marseille in the old Marseille style. And I'm talking like pre-elemental, pre-numerology. I think you can learn to read tarot from uh, people who don't use a Kabbalistic system. Both both Waite and Crowley's deck are heav heavily Kabbalah influenced, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's completely unessential, in my opinion, as well, in in order to read tarot effectively. And if you don't like any of the existing writing on tarot, I think you could go out and get a deck that you like the artwork of and read it however you want. You can make up your own system. So I'm a little uneasy when people start talking about Waite and, and Crowley as these authorities on tarot or that you have to learn um, things according to their systems with their baked in racist and sexist um, and anti-Semitic um, you know, stuff. Um, for example, um, A.E. Waite, when he has you pick a significator to represent the querent, he's, he tells you to look at their physical appearance and from their physical appearance, that's how you're going to select the significator. And he's like, this kind of white European is a wand and this kind of white European is a cup and this kind of white European is a sword and everybody else gets lumped into pentacles. You know, that's that's racist. <laughs> I don't think he means it in a mean way, but it is racist, you know, and and I haven't studied Crowley's um, writings in as much detail, but I do know from reading some of his own words and some of his own works, he, he, he holds similar beliefs. So I don't think that reading either one of them is going to make you a better tarot reader. And in fact, it may give you um, unintentionally, it may give you some problematic uh, stuff that you're going to have to work through. So that is my overview of A.E. Waite and Aleister Crowley. And I just want to say thank you for your time. Um, thank you again in advance for keeping it kind in the comments. And again, I welcome your considerate disagreement if you, if you would like to uh, have a discussion about uh, either of both of these figures in tarot. Um, I will not deny their influence is very, very large, um, but I will say that, you know, their, their influence is also largely unintentional, um, that they both developed uh, tarot decks and belief systems for their, their sort of elite group that they wanted to be leaders of. And I don't think either of them could have predicted or fully understood what new age occultism has has wrought, what had what it has become, um, how it has grown and outgrown in a lot of cases uh, their their understanding. Um, and with that, I'm going to sign off before I get myself in too much more trouble with the tarot community here on YouTube. Um, I appreciate you all for listening, and I will be back with an overview of the Golden Dawn deck compared with the two decks that Waite and Crowley developed just to take a look at the art and how that uh, developed over time. So until next time, I wish you all well. I invite you to think critically about any information that you're taking in and to do your tarot practice however you would like to do it. Be well, and I'll see you soon.